So tonight, it's my privilege to introduce to you Pastor Jerron Jones, who is the planter and lead pastor of Shine Bible Fellowship Church, along with his beautiful wife of 13 years, Bonnie. They have the joy of parenting two precious girls, Chloe and Kendall. And they long to see a church who is passionately pursuing a deeper relationship with Jesus through practical, relevant, and solid biblical teaching that's accompanied by authentic relationships with others in the church. And the end is to shine brightly. So shine Bible fellowship to radically transform our families, community, city, and beyond. Let's welcome Pastor Jerron Jones. Thank you, Stan. It's good to be here with you guys tonight. How are you guys doing? Good. Okay. All right. All right. You can talk back to me if you so desire. Um, amen. Right on. Right on. Not yet. Not yet. Let me, let me, let me say something first. Um, it is good to be with you all tonight. I do uh, remember my days here at Dallas Seminary slaving over papers and reports and, and reading or skim reading many hundreds of pages of texts and all these kinds of things. I don't miss that at all, really. Uh, but I do empathize, sympathize. I have pity on each one of you for, for what you're going to be going through these next couple of weeks. Is it finals? Oh, when are finals over? Two we Oh, yeah, two more weeks of this. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> good gracious. Well, I have a very simple message for you tonight. It's not, it's not high brow. It's not going to be hard for you to grasp. It's going to be very simple, very practical, hopefully something that you can uh, implement very quickly and easily into your lives. Um, I'm going to be coming from Matthew. Um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, a uh, very familiar passage of scripture for many of us. And uh, if you guys could just indulge me, let's just stand together for the reading of God's word. You know what, I'm going to pull it up. I have it on my notes, but I'm going to pull it up in the Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 25. And we're going to read down to verse 34. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible. You guys ready? All right. Here's what Jesus says. He says, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. In verse 33, he wraps this up and he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let me pray for us very briefly. Father, thank you for this time that we have in your word. Father, I pray that um, your word would find good ground in our hearts tonight, that a wonderful and rich um, bountiful harvest uh, would grow and be harvested from our lives as a result of our hearing and our application of your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk to you just very briefly tonight um, from the subject, why worry? Why worry? Why worry? Um, my six-year-old daughter's name is Kendall, and she went missing uh, one night not too long ago. Um, the scene was Cracker Barrel restaurant. It was a Friday night. We decided to go to Cracker Barrel. It's right down the house, right down the street from our house. It was raining that evening. And so when we came out of the restaurant, we decided to stand under the overhang a little bit, wait for the rain to subside a little bit. And then once it had subsided enough, we were going to make a mad dash, or we did make a mad dash to our SUV. We were going to jump in really quickly to try to get out of the rain. We did exactly what we set out to do. We said, one, two, three, go. And the four of us took our 
off running toward the SUV. We jumped into the SUV and my youngest daughter in the back seat with a very panicked voice said, where is Kendall? Where is Kendall? And so my wife and I just kind of look at each other. We look in the back seat and we just think that the girls are playing some type of trick on us, our nine-year-old and our six-year-old. They're playing some type of trick, some type of game. And when we look back and we look at each other and we look back again and she's saying, where's Kendall? And we're looking around and Kendall is nowhere to be found. I jump out of the passenger side of the car, which is where I was sitting, and I'm looking around and I'm beginning to panic because I see Kendall nowhere. And I look back, we just literally 10 seconds ago ran from underneath the overhanging Cracker Barrel. 10 seconds later, Kendall is nowhere to be found. In my mind, um, all kinds of scenarios played out in my head. My baby has been kidnapped, she's been taken. I'm gonna be on a press conference. I'm about to be a part of a fraternity that I never wanna be a part of because I will be a parent of a missing child. I'm panicking. My heart is racing. I'm, I'm just freaking out all within a, about 10 to 15 to 20 seconds, and I am certifiably worried. This is what worry does to us. Worry, panic, anxiety, what it does, it causes our hearts to race. It causes our minds to start spinning and racing and uh, uh, envisioning all types of scenarios that probably likely will never happen. But this is just kind of the nature of worry. And oftentimes when we're worried enough, it will often cause us to act very unwisely in the decisions that we make, especially pertaining to our walk with Jesus. And to, do to, and to this, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us, and he tells his audience, do not worry. If there were a sermon that were, would have gone viral that Jesus preached, it would have been this particular sermon. This is one of his most popular sermons that we have recorded in the text. This sermon uh, touches on a variety of things, but one thing in particular, Jesus seems to take out some time in all of this to say, look, I want you to understand a few things about worry. If we're going to experience the totality of what God has for us, worry cannot come along the journey that God has for us. If we are going to experience the totality of what God has for us in life and in ministry, worry cannot be a passenger in our vehicle along this journey. So what does Jesus have to say about worry? The first thing he has to tell us about worry is that worry distracts. Worry distracts. He's talking to an audience of peasants. These peasants are, are dependent, 100% dependent upon the weather uh, and agriculture for their very survival. If he were ever talking to a group of people that might be justified in worrying, it is this particular audience. They can look out uh, into the sky every morning when they wake up, and they can look out over their pastures, and they can tell if it's going to be a good day, a good week, a good month, just based on on the weather and to these people, Jesus says, do not worry. Now, if I were in the crowd, I'm typically a pessimist when it comes to these kinds of things. I would probably say, well, Jesus, that is really easy for you to say. It's easy for you to say you are a person who has turned water into wine. If you could turn water into wine, you never have to worry about being thirsty. If you can turn water into wine, you can probably turn dirt into a dozen donuts, so you would probably never have to be hungry. You can turn sand into sandwiches. Jesus, I can understand you not worrying, but why are you telling me to worry? It just doesn't seem possible that I can go through life without worry. And Jesus doesn't back off. He says, I don't want you to worry. And he's going to lay out a very logical argument for why we should not worry. Worry, very uh, simply put, is an unreasonable or an abnormal unease about a problem or a situation. Worry is an unreasonable or abnormal unease about a problem or situation. I love what Corey Ten Boom, she was an author and Holocaust survivor. She said, worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts swirling around a center of fear. Let me say that again. She said, worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts swirling around a center of fear. And worry thrives in places where there's uncertainty about the future. It thrives in places where there's, there's some shifts to the normal way of doing things. Worry tends to hang out in our finances when we're in seminary and we're wondering how we're going to pay for the next semester. If we're a missionary on the mission field, we're saying, well, are we going to raise enough support to continue the ministry that God has given? If we're church planners like me, you're saying, am I going to have the financial resources to be able to get this church off the ground? And worry hangs out in our finances. Worry hangs out. If you're a parent, you worry about your child. Will our child have the 
future that we want for our child? Will, will, will our child um, come from a place of being missing to, to being found again? Will our children be saved? Will our, our, will our children be okay? We worry about our health. If you're anything like me, if there's anything that goes wrong with your body, the first thing you do is you get on Google and you start Googling, I have a pain in my side. And if you don't find a satisfactory answer, you might just go to the emergency room. And they might just give you a Tylenol and send you home and charge you 600 bucks for it. But because of your worry, you have to do something about it. And if you're like me too, you probably think everything's cancer. If, if it's any kind of lump or bump on your body, the, one of the first things your mind goes to is, oh man, I have cancer. And I am immediately worried. Worried hangs out in ministry. It hangs out in seminary classrooms. When I get out of seminary, will I have a job? Am I really good enough? to do this? Am I really called to this? Worry hangs out in pulpits. Will key families leave the church? Will, will people actually continue to show up? Will they continue to give? Worry hangs out in elder board meetings. Will we have the financial means to meet the budget to do what God wants us to do? Worry it hangs out everywhere. It hung out with King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13. You might recall the story. King Saul was in a, in a panic, in a frenzy. He was worried because he had the enemy. The Philistines were coming against him with thousands of men and chariots. They were coming, and, and the, uh, his men were leaving. People were scattering, abandoning him. Here he is afraid. Uh, the prophet Samuel had not shown up when Saul thought he would show up by. He makes this sacrifice. Then Samuel comes on the scene, and Samuel says to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept, in verse 13, he says, you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever over Israel. Here we see a man who is bogged down with worry, anxiety, fear. He panics and he makes a terrible decision. And to that, Jesus would say, don't worry. In response to our uncertainty and our fear, we tend to take our eye off of God and we try to take matters into our own hands. And it's in these moments that Jesus says, my dear brother, my dear sister, do not worry. In verse 25, he says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Jesus seems to be inviting us to take a step back and look at the big picture. And he's telling us, guys, look, life is much bigger than your light and momentary affliction that you're going through right now. There's a bigger picture, a bigger plan that God is still going to accomplish in your life. Take a step back. Life is more than food. Life is more than clothing. The first thing he shows us is that worry has a tendency to distract us. The second thing Jesus shows us is that worry is unreasonable. Everybody say unreasonable. Worry is unreasonable. And then he gives us a simple lesson from nature. He says, guys, th think about the birds of the air. In verse 26, he says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He says, look outside, look up, and you'll see the birds, and they are going to kind of model for you what it looks like not to worry. I looked this up some time ago. There are about 400 billion birds at any given time in the world. 400 billion birds. This includes y'all. Yard birds. You guys know what yard bird is, right? <laughs> yard bird, that's chicken. Now, I don't know. Now, y'all remember the great chicken sandwich war of, of 2019 when Chick-fil-A and Papa said maybe it's 390 million birds out there now after we ate up, we ate up all the chicken. We, we sold Popeyes out of fried chicken. Can you believe that? Um, anyway, anyway, there are about 400 or maybe 390 million or billion birds um, that exist right now. And every day, these birds, the majority of them, go out into the world. They go to work, but they don't worry. They wake up whenever they wake up, and they fly off to wherever they're flying off. And a lot of them, a large number of these birds, are called feeder birds. These birds do not store up stuff. They don't have refrigerators in their nests. They don't have pantries in their nests. They don't try to gather and, and, and have food for three, four, five, six months. They just wake up, they go to work, and they don't worry. They just trust God to just provide for whatever God's going to provide or for the day, the provision that God's going to provide. They are just trusting God. And, and Jesus says, I want you to look at the birds. Now we have grocery stores, we have freezers, we have refrigerators, we have restaurants, we have friends' houses we can go to, we can go to food pantries, shelters. We, we have um, a little reason, little excuse to worry about how we're going to eat or what we're going to eat. And Jesus says if there's anybody that should worry, it would be feeder birds because they don't have any way of storing up a reserve anywhere. And even look at them, they're not worried. Look to the birds. Then he says, 
Um, then look at the clothing. Look at, look at how God clothes the lilies of the field. He says in verse 28, he says, and why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. The lilies don't clothe themselves. The lilies, are, the lilies are clothed by God. Now, if Solomon were alive today, and if he lived in Houston, Solomon would likely be a leader or a businessman that lives in River Oaks. Everybody's familiar with the River Oaks area. I don't, I don't frequent that area very much. I have no business um, in River Oaks, in the River Oaks area. Um, but if Solomon were alive, Solomon would be hanging out there. Solomon would likely have his own personal tailor or two, and he would have custom-made clothes. He would have the finest linen, the finest clothes that you could ever make. Solomon probably wouldn't even let you hug him because he wouldn't want you getting any oil or anything on his on his expensive clothes and his expensive suits. And, God, and Jesus says, look, watch this. God has done the lilies even one better than Solomon. Solomon's wardrobe has nothing on the lilies that God has clothed. Now look, the lilies never step, step foot into a clothing store and yet God clothes them even to the point that even to the extent that Solomon's wardrobe was radiant. God dresses them and so they don't even have to worry about what they will wear. Jesus is about to tell us why worry is unreasonable. He says, don't worry about your food, don't worry about your clothing. Let me just throw this in here real quick. I remember I went to lunch with a pastor and he asked me one time, he said, hey, where do you wanna to go to eat? And I, I said, well, you pick. And he uh, was a pastor from a well-heeled church, if you if you know what I mean. And he picked a, an expensive place to eat. So when I get there, I'd never heard of the place, but when I got there and I saw the menu prices, I began to worry. Um, can I afford <laughs> to eat at this place? And so I'm looking at the menu and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the appetizers and I'm saying, okay, I'll just order off the appetizer menu and I'll just tell them I ate a big breakfast and that's why I'm ordering an appetizer. Really, I'm worried about how we're going to pay for this thing. And so I really didn't enjoy the lunch because I'm worried about the provision for the lunch <laughs> that is coming from this restaurant. And at the end, when the bill came, he said, I'll take the bill. And I said, oh, I'm so grateful that you pay for the bill. He said, well, of course I'm paying for it. If I invited you to lunch, I'll always pay for it. You never have to worry about how you're going to pay for your lunch if you're with me. I've got it, and so I couldn't enjoy it because worry had, had paralyzed me. And Jesus says, don't worry about food, don't worry about clothes, worry is unreasonable, and here's why, verse 26, he says, are you not worth much more than them? Are you not worth more than the bird? Are you not worth more than the lily? And if you are, and because you are, it is unreasonable for you to worry. In verse 30 says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow we just throw the grass in the furnace in order to be, you know, fire for our, our meal, how much more will God clothe you? James Harden is the most valuable player on the Rockets. There's no disputing that. If you want to debate that he's league MVP, we can debate that. But if you want to debate that he's the, the best player on the Rockets, you would lose that debate. He is by far the most valuable player for the Houston Rockets. Last year, there was a man by the name of Isaiah Hartenstein. Anybody heard of him? Exactly. Oh, a couple people, a couple people. Most of you have not heard of Isaiah Hardenstein. Isaiah Hardenstein is the guy that sits at the end of the bench. And if the game is a blowout, he may get in a few times. But Isaiah Hardenstein gets on the, the team playing. He wears the team apparel. He gets free access into games. He gets free stuff, just like all the other players. Now, now, if Isaiah Hardenstein gets access to all of the stuff that the Rockets get, how much more would James Harden get access to the same stuff. How silly would it look for James Harden to just be like, well, man, I'm worried Isaiah got a new jump jumpsuit. I don't think I'm gonna get mine. What are you talking about, James? You are the most valuable player and Jesus is telling us something similar. You are so much more to me than even those. And if I take care of those, I'm gonna take care of you. Worry is unreasonable. There's a song that said, his eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on the bird. And so I know that he watches over me. And when we worry, what we're really saying is we lack the faith that God is really going to take care of us. Jesus also lastly tells us, yes, worry doesn't work. Worry is unreasonable, but also tells us that worry just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. In verse 27, if you go back a little bit, he says, and who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Worry just doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't profit us anything to worry. Then in James, James chapter 4, verse 13, James says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, and we will spend a year there, and we will engage in business and make a profit, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, 
we will live and also do this or that. And what James is telling us, and what Jesus is also showing us is we are powerless to control tomorrow by worrying what is that gonna accomplish? What is that gonna do? It's not gonna add any time to our life. And if we worry long enough, we will eventually see that what they're saying is true. And our best course of action is to fire ourselves and to give God his job back and let God be in charge and let us slide over into the passenger seat and just let God take us where he wants to take us. We're gonna, we need to put God back in his rightful place and trust that he can do a better job than what our worry can do for us. Then in verse 31, Jesus continues. He says, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing for the Gentiles eagerly seek these things for your heavenly father knows that you need these things. This is what I call the OMG uh, passage of the Sermon on the Mount, the OMG. This is when, you, when you're overwhelmed with the, a to-do list. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do, you can't even sleep at night because you're so worried about what's going to happen the next day. And, and so when I read this, I'm saying it like, OMG, um, what are we going to, uh, what, what are we going to eat? OMG, what are we going to drink? OMG, what are we going to wear? And we sound like Gentiles to Jesus. Jesus says, when you do this, when you work yourself up into a frenzy, when you're worried like this, you act like you don't know God. You act like you don't know that God is a gracious and merciful and loving father who will take care of you. You're acting as if, as if God is a stranger and like you are a Gentile. So after he lays out this logical argument about why we shouldn't worry, he then says you're a more efficient use of your time would be to be consumed by God. He says in verse 33, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. If we are consumed with seeking after God, seeking after the master, seeking after this very God who loves us and wants to see us flourish in the things of the kingdom, then we won't have time to worry. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, Paul tells us, don't be anxious, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, present your request to God. And then this weird thing will happen when we do this. He says, and the peace of God, that surpasses all understanding, meaning this is a peace that is illogical. People will look, how do you have peace when your child is missing? How do you have peace when um, you're a missionary and you're only halfway to raising your support? How do you have peace when it doesn't look like the future that you envision for your kids is going to happen? How do you have peace in a church where there's declining attendance? How do you have this peace? And he's saying this peace, if you would pray and you would leave these things in God's hands, let God do the worrying and you pray, as Martin Luther says, then this peace will overwhelm you and this is what Jesus is offering us. Seek first. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will take care of themselves. As I said a little bit ago, Jesus is, is imploring us to do what Martin Luther said. He says, pray. Our job is to pray and to let God do the worrying. Our job is to pray and we let God do the worrying. My six-year-old, in fact, was not missing. When we had made this mad dash, from the overhang of the Cracker Barrel restaurant, we were parked next to an SUV that was the same color as our SUV. And so dear Kendall had run to the wrong SUV and was frantically trying to open the door as she, as she, as she normally does. And we are panicked and running around trying to find our dear Kendall. And Kendall found herself at the wrong place, but we got into the right car. And after all this settled, I found myself, when we got home, my heart was still racing. And here's what happened. I got so worried in these 20 to 30 seconds where I thought my child was kidnapped or missing or hit by a car or something that it threw me off for at least another 30 minutes. It took that long for me to just finally relax. And this is what Jesus is inviting us to today. If Jesus were here today, I believe he would say, just relax. Just relax. I got this. By worrying, it's going to distract you from what God wants you to do. By worrying, you can't add a single day to your life. It just doesn't work. By worrying, um, what was the other thing? Worrying is unreasonable, and he invites us into the rest that he and only he can give. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have taken time to even address this, this subject, this topic of worry that all of us deal with on a daily basis. It's my prayer for us tonight that whatever um, would cause us anxiety, fear, um, worry, panic, whatever that thing might be in our lives, that we'll be reminded today of the scriptures that this is not what pleases you. 
and that you have given us a better course, and that course is to seek you and to be consumed by your love, by your mercy, by your grace, and to trust you wholeheartedly. And I just pray that as these students go through the rest of their semester, God, even if they're worried about classes, about finances, about family, about ministry, God, that the perfect peace of God that surpasses all understanding would wash over them and would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We love you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.